As soon as we there do, it goes. you We're should okay. bring Kathy in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You, you should be all set. Thanks for catching that, Mandy. All right. No problem. And Kathy, come in now. I'm going to call this meeting again to order. It's 1032 Governance Organization Legislation. It is September 30. And pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting, open meeting law, this meeting of GOL is being conducted via remote participation. I'm first going to check and make sure that everyone can be heard and can be uh, seen if they wish to be. And uh, starting with my committee members, and we also have, I believe have, good, Kathy's already been brought in, thank you. Um, so I'm going to start uh, just looking at the screen. Mandy? Here. Okay, the chair is here. Lynn? Present. Thank you. Uh, Andy? Yes, present. Thank you. Pat? Yes. Good. And uh, now our, our panelist guest today, uh, Kathy? Yes, here. Thank you. Good. Lisa? Yes. Great. And Chris? Present. Good, thank you all. So everyone is present and accounted for. Um, just a brief quick note about the agenda. The only real item of substance is continued review of wage theft and responsible employer bylaws. So those two bylaws are what are on our plate today. Um, I did have an item three if we got through. <laughs> I was sort of perhaps in a state of uh, fog when I thought we might get through two and get to three, but if we do, um, I thought we might continue to talk a little bit about the process for town managed performance and assessment goals. The process is what I want to talk about. And that's also something we can take up briefly at discussion of future agenda items, because that was the chair's genius thought. And I'm not sure my colleagues agree. I don't think we're going to get to that today, but it is item number three. We do have a set of minutes to approve. I hope people have had a chance to look at them. I've looked at them and they, they look fine. Um, and then obviously we have any items not anticipated. So the main item uh, for the next probably two hours is going to be a review of the uh, revised versions of wage theft and responsible employee bylaws. Um, those are in your packet and hopefully you have access to them. At the appropriate moment, Mandy will put them up on the screen and um, we will be keeping track of any changes we make if we make any. Um, but before we get to that, we have an item I think we have to deal with first uh, related to wage theft and to um, responsible bylaw. This is a committee issue. Uh, apologize to our guests, but we need to discuss it, I think, first. I was thinking of putting it off, but I, I, my, in reflection, I think we should talk about it uh, up front, um, though you're welcome to disagree and we could change that. So Andy, you had raised a point with me um, that I felt uh, was worth a discussion by the committee as a whole. So if you would raise that issue, um, if you don't mind, uh, and then we will talk about it before we turn to the actual review of the bylaws. So Andy, I'm asking you to, to speak. Okay, this is a, uh, not a comfortable discussion to start and I don't really wanna spend a lot of time now discussing it because I really, I think substance it's going to be important, but it, I did do appreciate the opportunity to bring it up now. Um, I find that it is um, a little bit uncomfortable having a committee of five members who are working on whether this is uh, an actionable bylaw with two of the members of the committee also being co-sponsors of the bylaw. And I think about it in terms of what we did with the um, plastic bag bylaws, the experience, and um, Council, Councilor DeMont was very helpful as a part of the discussion, but there was a real division. It was a real clear uh, division between the members of the committee and what our responsibility was and her role as an advocate trying to find solutions to the wording of the bylaw that would um, address the question um, that was before us and the issues before us. Uh, and uh, as we've continued on this discussion, I've become increasingly uncomfortable about it to the point that I felt that it need, needed to be 
placed into the discussion at some point uh, to talk about. Uh, so I said this is hard uh, because there are two uh, members of the committee that I respect so greatly and uh, work with very closely and appreciate. Um, and uh, that, that that makes it uh, and also a harder discussion to have down the line, but I don't think that I could avoid bringing up the awkwardness um, of the situation and um, how that reflects on the committee and the credibility of the committee's work going forward. Um, having said that, um, I think the George touched on the thing at the beginning as to whether we need to have that discussion now or can dive into the bylaw and I leave that to the chair. So conclude, conclude there. Okay, Andy, thank you. Um, my initial instinct was to hold this off until we had finished our review and then have this discussion since in my mind, it concerns really the issue of voting and not the issue of review. Um, but I also felt that that's perhaps something that the committee uh, should at least be aware of and maybe want to discuss. Um, so that's why I asked Andy to lead off the meeting so that at least you're aware of this issue. Um, the next question becomes, do we want a full discussion of it now? Which I'm certainly open to doing. Um, my preference would be to wait until after review and then have that discussion. Um, but I also felt that that's really a decision that should be made by the committee, or at least with the committee's uh, agreement. So for the moment, I wanna just turn to my colleagues and um, you can go either way. You can discuss the issue if you wish right now, uh, that's perfectly open, or you can um, just weigh in on whether you think this is something that now that it's been brought to the table, um, people are aware of it, um, we will come back to it um, after we finished our review. So that's the uh, two options here. So thoughts from <clears throat> my colleagues on this. George, um, I have my hand raised. Please, um, Lynn, go ahead. <laughs> it's a complicated one, but I have to be, I mean, the reality is that um, in the charter, we're very clear that all counselors are created equal and that there's no differentiation among counselors. And that's also made clear um, with regard to the president voting on things. And so a part of me uh, feels that while I think we need to be upfront about this, uh, that no counselor should ever be denied uh, the ability to vote on something that comes before a committee of the council or the council. Andy? So obviously Pat has lost connection. Um, I'm gonna see if she can call in, but um, so this has come up before. Um, particularly when GOL was considering the, um, what was it, the um, election bylaw, the election financing bylaw um, that Evan and I sponsored. And Evan and I were both on GOL at the time. And we participated in the discussion, um, mainly as sponsors, but also a little bit as GOL, but but you know, sort of the same manner that Darcy did and that I feel like Pat and I are doing on this one, which is sort of as the sponsors trying to respond to all of the concerns of the committee and of the legal opinion and all to get a bylaw that the sponsors are, um, are happy with, but that also gets the rest of the committee to the actionability and being able to vote for actionable. I looked up our vote. Um, oh, that is Pat calling me. Hold on a second. I will answer that. Let me see if I can help take care of Pat. Yeah. Um, so I looked up the vote for that um, campaign finance bylaw, and it was a three to zero vote. Um, 
with two abstentions because the two sponsors that happened to sit on the committee abstained from the vote for clear, consistent, and actionable. Um, and and um, and I think that is a reasonable solution to this one too. Is that um, because the sponsors in terms of whether it's clear, consistent or actionable can have a potential conflict. Um, it, it's one that they could choose to vote on their own or they can abstain, but um, it's not an actual conflict in terms of anything regarding conflict of interest law um, because we are legislators, that's what we're here to do. Um, so I, I would argue that participating in the conversation both as sponsors and as committee members um, is reasonable um, and that it's more appropriate. And from my point of view, I will likely abstain from any vote made on these bylaws as a GOL member because I've done it in the past as a sponsor, but that doesn't mean I shouldn't be participating in a discussion um, as sponsor. And that's mainly what I'm doing here is working with my co-sponsors to get this bylaw to a point that the co-sponsors are, are happy with it, um, but that the GOL committee can get to a point where they can vote on it. I see Lynn's hand up, or is that a residual? It's not a residual, it's actually to raise a different issue. Please, Lynn, um, go ahead. Okay, the issue that I wanna raise is whether or not the, by the time we get done with this, we feel it has been substantially altered to the point that it has to go back to CRC and or the TSO. And I, I just don't want to get caught in the situation that I feel like we did with the plastic bag. I, I just want us to keep that in mind and then also decide whether or not at some point we um, hold off our vote until those referrals have been made. Pat's trying to connect. Hi, Pat. Okay. Um, anyway, that's uh, that was the other issue I wanted to raise. I'm lowering my hand. Okay. Okay. So that's a separate issue, but it's been raised as well. Thank you. Um, I see Andy's hand up, and I think uh, um, before I re recognize Andy, I wonder if Pat, uh, since she was kind of away, um, did you have something you wanted to say now, Pat? Um, before I recognize. I, Andy? I didn't hear any of the conversation, but I, uh, oh, right. but I right. did, uh, I do know that um, the, I, I, you're, I think you're asking Mandy and I to recuse ourselves from the decision. From or, the vote, yeah, on clear, consistent, actionable. Yeah, uh, and I don't want to do that, but I can understand the reasoning behind it. Um, but I'm uncomfortable with it. That's... Okay. I mean, uh, that is what we did with uh, Evan and Mandy Joe before, isn't that? Yes. Yeah. So that it's is. it's fair. But I want to be included in the discussion. That's the piece that is critical. Andy. Yeah. No, I just wanted to uh, uh, building a little bit on what Mandy said. My prior comment. Uh, that I was uh, not trying to hold up the discussion that we really are want to focus on right now, which is um, the pieces that um, are in the work drafts of the bylaw. And uh, I, I felt it was a courtesy not to delay mentioning the concern, but I don't want to hold up the discussion that we intended to have today. So I'm going to just offer my two cents and then I think try to bring this to a conclusion. Um, I don't think if I understand what Andy's, the point Andy was raising, it's not about uh, the participation of the sponsors, including council sponsors in our deliberations. That is not the issue. So um, participation of Mandy and Pat uh, in our deliberations um, is not the question at all. The question is whether they should be allowed to vote on the issue when it actually comes to a vote. Um, and there I think there is, I'm not sure I agree with Mandy, and this maybe was something we'll come back to later, 
my feeling at the moment is that, um, though in the past it was an abstention, um, I wonder if in fact the committee should make a decision one way or the other, uh, and whether it should even be the option. Um, leaving it up to the individual counselor. Can somebody like, tell me what Mandy Joe said? Well, I think, and maybe I should let Mandy speak for herself. I understood her to, to say that she definitely did not want to be left out of the discussion. And I, I just wanted to clarify that that, of course, is, that wasn't at all what I took uh, Andy's point to be uh, on that in the past, it was an abstention um, and which left it open to the individual counselor, which kind of echoes Lynn's point about counselors having the right to decide to vote on a matter before their committee. Um, it seemed to echo Lynn's point that the counselor should have the option of, of voting. Um, and if they choose to abstain, fine. If they choose to vote one way or the other, fine. Um, as opposed to what I'm thinking or suggesting that we talk about, which is the committee decide that when you do have members of the committee who are sponsors of a particular uh, bylaw or, or um, um, right, and I assume that would include resolutions, right? So it can, maybe this is right, but um, that they would not be allowed to vote. They'd have to recuse. So that's the issue as I see it. I don't know if we want to spend any more time on it now, but I'm going to recognize Mandy with her hand up and then Pat. So yeah, I, to, to fill Pat in, I said that this is a perceived conflict that can be declared in a sense, um, but we are legislators. It's not even really a conflict under any conflict of interest law per se. Um, and therefore, and it's not an actual conflict under any conflict of interest law. So, so we don't have to recuse ourselves at all um, and that it should be up to the individual counselors to choose whether they abstain or not. Um, I would heartily object to a committee telling a counselor whether they can or cannot vote. That is not a committee's role in anything. Um, I am a counselor. I am elected to vote. Um, that, that would be like telling me that I can sponsor legislation as a counselor, but then I can't vote on my own legislation at the council meeting. And that's just entirely wrong in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Good. And for, for, I, I'm sorry, I missed yeah. that because that was very clear, Mandy Joe. The other thing is that I've sponsored resolutions and I've always been able to vote on them in our committee, um, both be, be, previously and with this group. Um, and so I am going to vote. Uh, I want to participate in the discussion and will vote as a legislator. Thank you, Mandy Joe. Lynn, your hand is up. George, I. I also do not believe the committee should be making a ruling like this. I, as I said, when Pat was not here, I feel that every counselor has a vote regardless of the issue. Um, and that uh, I, if we decided on this, then we set a precedent for other committees that anything that, that is sponsored by a, a counselor has to, they have to recuse themselves. And then my question would be, well, what happens when it comes before the full council? I would find it totally not appropriate to have sponsors of something having to recuse themselves at a full council meeting. Okay. All right. Um, I'm ready to move on. I don't know if Andy has any final thoughts. Um, I have other thoughts, but I think I want to let them lay for the moment and proceed to the matter at hand. But um, I see no hands. Okay. So, um, Let's turn to the, uh, now I'll turn to the sponsors to decide which of the two bylaws. One has, I think, far more um, changes and um, than the other in terms of your, you had a discussion, my understanding is you had a discussion with KP Law, and this was a discussion between the counsel, counselor sponsors and KP Law. And then as a result of that discussion and further uh, reflection, you have uh, presented us two documents um, that um, we got yesterday. Um, so there's going to be some challenge there, I think, with at least some of us catching, getting up to speed. But um, do you have a preference as to which bylaw you want to tackle first? I think a responsible employer had the most issues. So that would be probably where we should start. Any thoughts there, Mandy? Um, Want to start with responsible? Uh, okay. No. That was going to be my thoughts too, because it's got more more issues to discuss. All right. Fair enough. And 
Um, we need to just agree on procedure here. Um, my feeling is we work literally line by line uh, through the document. In some places that may be that we can, the changes are not of any substance and we can move quickly to the next. But I would think we would need to look at each change um, in the document. Um, how do the rest of you feel about that as opposed to jumping around? Can I just explain something? Sure, please. I don't know ahead. whether this one's marked. Blue is KP laws changes, red and orange are sponsor changes. Okay. How about purple? Well, if you're looking at the share screen, it should be blue, red, and orange. I see, thank you. <laughs> I, I can't say what yours pop up as. <laughs> my printed copy, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't know what printed copies look like. Go, but that's blue is what KP law suggested. Red and orange is sponsor suggestions or changes. If it's not marked, like if we're looking here with Amherst, we're okay with the addition of that, if that makes sense. Um, we crossed out town and went with home rule charter, for example, because that's the actual name. It's not the town charter, it's the home rule charter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and things like that that don't have comments in our discussions with KP law we're, we're fine with KP law, if that makes sense. Can you clarify again? So on the screen, blue is KP law? Yes. And red is? Red and orange are sponsors. Thank you. Now, when the sponsors have made changes, these are changes made after um, the KP law review, or these were changes made prior there to? Almost all of them are prior to or during the review with the discussion we had with KP law. I think there is one change that KP law has not seen. Okay, I'm that's the only that yeah, think, when we get to it. Okay, thank you. All right. So um, my thought is to go through this uh, literally change by change and um, open to any question or discussion. If there is none, then I assume by consent, we will move to the next item. And that item stays as it's as it is written or as it has been changed. Okay, so all right. Under A, first paragraph. Any comments, questions, concerns about these changes? These are changes that the sponsors have made and KP Law has seen. I'm fine. Okay, um, I'm, I'm not going to stop unless I hear someone may to speak up. I have my window open so I can see raised hand, but um, if, if I miss you, just, just yell out and we'll go back. B, item one, again, a change um, here, which is um, KP Law and also by a sponsor. Any concerns here? All right, proceed. Uh, we are now at, uh, this I believe is still so this is the, Go ahead, Andy. So six, the highlighted area is a change we made that KP Law has not seen. Um, we talked with KP Law about the addition of the phrase um, and it was meant to, the phrase KP Law added was meant to modify the second half of the definition of tax relief, not the first half, um, everything after or. Um, we were still unclear what it actually meant and all um, and afterwards and what KP Law had described was a concern about this bylaw being applicable to things like the um, elder, elderly uh, tax write-off work program that is technically tax relief or the veterans tax relief that the council grants every year at the same time it votes the budget and stuff. So our attempt to clarify is to actually reference the MGL section that those tax relief items fall under in, and then still delete the phrase because we felt the phrase was very unclear and was hard to understand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Comments from the committee. Um, I see no hands, but um, raised hands. I think Andy's trying to comment. Andy, please go ahead. You're muted, Andy. 
That's because I hit the wrong button. I hit mute me instead of raise hand. Uh, so the um, one thing that I've been thinking about with this section all along actually gets back to our one very serious and live episode in Amherst, which is the tax relief that was provided through the um, special legislation and the bylaw as enacted by town meeting that provided uh, that provides that the town can uh, give tax abatement and tax relief in tax re as a form of tax relief for um, an affordable housing agreement which was uh, part of the beacon agreement and uh, the that was a very uh, special kind of situation because what happened was the town meeting passed the bylaw and then um, it was concluded that we didn't have the authority to do it without special legislation sandy pooler who was at that time working for the town worked with kp law and with the legislative delegation to get a special special legislation passed to allow us to do that and then the select board entered into an agreement with beacon of course i've lived through all of that piece of it because i was on the select board at the time so i wanted to make sure um, that if we're going to go down this path that we not exclude that agreement which is really uh, not only a very important form of tax relief but um, is actually hits back to the one very serious example we have of where there was um, a problem with wage theft happening so mandy i uh, i just don't know if we're there So I don't think MGL chapter 59, section five, which would be excluded from this relates to that special legislation at all. And under the definition under six, that special legislation would be the, or pursuant to any other provision of law or regulation authorizing the town to grant tax relief. So it would be included in this bylaw and be subject to this bylaw, that special law. We were actually concerned that the phrase that KP law tried to add unrelated to statutory provisions for tax abatements and exemptions um, might actually remove that special legislation from this bylaw, this bylaw being applicable to it. It was, it was part of our concern with, we had problems understanding what that phrase truly did, which is why the sponsors don't want to keep that phrase and we tried to address it in a different manner. Have you given any consideration to, I, I don't know how that special legislation was cited within the session laws, mm -hmm. um, but inclusion of the special of the session law designation, if possible, within the same area that you have TIF agreement. Andy, you don't feel that the phrase or pursuant to any other provision of law or regulation authorizing the town to grant tax relief, you don't feel that that covers your concern? I, um, if the, if the um, sponsors are comfortable with it, I will go with it. I just didn't want to pass it by without some form of discussion because I do think that it uh, is such a key piece of uh, the mm -hmm. legislative effort that we've enacted in the town. Kathy, I see your hand is up. Yes, I, I just, uh, my argument for the general wording as Mandy explained was, um, if that was a special legislation, we would have to keep rewriting this bylaw if we figure out another special legislation that's somewhat similar, but not the same. Um, so I think the broader language that's an umbrella is better if you don't want to keep having to drop in. As, as I understood from Andy, this wasn't a 
applies to all places. It was just applied to Amherst, um, that special legislation. So yeah, that is my recollection. But I don't think we want to anchor it in just one instance of something where right. these NGLs are nice and broad. Um, they are broad. They're not nice and broad. They are broad. Okay, I see no other hands up. Anyone else uh, with a thought or comment on this? My thought is it's covered by the phrase that I just read. And I think I sense Kathy and Mandy would agree. Um, the point has been raised as Andy requested. I don't see any reason to change this or to um, alter it. Anyone else? Does this, is this the one area you said you had not checked back with KP Law? This, this is the one, one section that we changed. We talked to KP Law about it. We said we'd try to clarify what her thing was, but then we didn't go back. We didn't do it during the meeting and when we were meeting afterwards to do that clarification, this is what we came up with. So KP Law has not seen this. Do you see? It might, might be prudent for the chair to send this to KP Law just to make sure. I'm sorry, um, Lynn. No, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, I would think that would be appropriate. I don't know what others think, but it would be quick. I mean, I just got to turn around on an item. Uh, I think they've gotten the message from us, if I may be so bold, because <laughs> I sent them something about the wild animal bylaw and it came back within 48 hours, which is, I think, a world's record. So I think <laughs> with, with, with this one, um, given the history of, uh, of this bylaw, they would be very quick in response. Um, but I would, my instinct would be any change that we make today of substance that um, KP Law hasn't seen, it would be prudent for us to at least run it by them before we sign off completely. George, I appreciate uh, your belief that they'll send it quickly. You're probably right. Um, but I think it would need to be stated that it needed to be back within 24 hours or something. It's very small, very minor. And I, I don't, I want this on the agenda for Monday's meeting. There may be more than one item like this before we're done today. So, um, and there may not, but um, my sense is that I should send this item to KP Law with a request to have it returned to us as soon as possible. Before, in time for the October oh. 5th agenda. Okay. Otherwise, we're just playing the same old game. Okay. Okay, I think we can move on then. Kathy has her hand raised. Sorry, Kathy, please go ahead. I, I just, I'm, I'm going to excuse myself because I, I have my mother living with us and a nurse has just come to see her. So I've got to oh. go. Okay. Take care, enjoy, Kathy. Enjoy yeah. everything. All right, bye bye. <laughs> Kathy. Okay, uh, next change is C1. This was just to clarify which sections go out go into the contract. Right. Good. I have no issue with that. Anyone? I don't see any hands. Please speak up. If you don't, if I don't recognize you, just yell out. I'm looking at three screens at the moment. <laughs> um, we're looking at F. So the sponsors had no problems with the additions in F and G. Okay. All right. That would, I seem would be fine. H. So the question that remains in H, um, we were fine with the Endeavor 2 addition and the removal of at a minimum. We recapitalized people of color because it's defined in the definitions and that's what our general thing is, is to keep it capitalized if it's a definitional issue. Um, Lauren had indicated a thing about potentially removing the numbers. The, she didn't actually do that on here though, but I highlighted it in pink as a potential area where there's still disagreement. The sponsors want to keep the numbers as listed. Um, where there is still disagreement um, is in the pink highlighted section at the end of H. The sponsors like the original language. Um, they are willing, we are willing to keep the new language if we also add the original language back in. Um, I think Pat can speak more to <laughs> why we want the original, um, but, but we're okay with a compromise of going with KP Law's language, but also our language. Um, and I did not draft that compromise into this document. 
Right. What, I'm sorry, why did KP Law want the percentages out? No doubt, difficult to enforce. Well, she argued that it's difficult yeah, to justify. She's concerned about challenge. Yeah. Uh, but quite it. literally, these percentages have um, are um, in East Hampton's bylaws. They're in Lynn's bylaws, um, and um, Mandy Joe, aren't they part of a they're state? The, the Governor Patrick's executive order. Yeah. Percentages Thank from you. His executive order. So we feel strongly that. Uh, they need to be there, Get, particularly given the climate that we're in right now. Uh, we want to make every effort to include people of color and low veterans, et cetera, and women in projects like this. And we understand that a contractor would endeavor to provide uh, and would not be penalized if they didn't manage to meet those percentages for, for reasonable, reasonable reasons. Okay, um, Andy. Yeah, I'm going to go back to G as uh, uh, a part of my comments here too. But uh, I wanted I, I am a little bit uncomfortable with percentages um, being included, partly because of Lauren's comments and partly because going back to um, some of our. Our, our previous discussion about uh, the point that was made, what if uh, an additional bylaw was passed that might bring uh, um, need to be included in that section that we just previously were where it identified TIFs and other um, related subjects. Uh, it, it's uh, like, what if the governor's order is changed on percentage numbers? And if the only thing that we have to legally hang our hat on, if challenged on this, is the percentage uh, that is based upon something that was an executive order, and not even a legislative piece, um, then we're put in the position, if challenged, of having to defend it. And I think that that may be what Lauren's concern is. Um, and then turning back to G so that I can complete both at the same time, I've given a lot of thought to this question about, and I should have raised it when we were, but we went by F and G so fast. Right. So yeah. the preference to Amherst residents, um, I um, understand why we would put that in there, but um, I have to reflect back on it from my experiences uh, Western Massachusetts, uh, when I was executive director of the legal aid program that is now um, CLA's, um, but it was Western Mass Legal Services when I was director, had an attorney come to me from the Springfield office and said, one of um, that we have had uh, workers who have tried to get hired onto this project and were excluded because a neighboring community was giving preference and uh, the discrepancy of people of color between who we represent in the, out of the Springfield office and that community is so great. We think it's challengeable I think that my response would have been if the um, litigation director signs off on it, I authorize the lawsuit because uh, that's how we would have worked it. Uh, I think that, that it, 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 it was making me uncomfortable. Mandy Jo has her hand up. Please, Mandy. So I, I want to remind our committee that this review is for clear consistency, clear clarity, consistency, and actionability. And Lauren has not tagged G as inactionable, um, that it is written to be legally actionable, even if it's hard to, if, even if on a um, substantive level, some individuals may not agree with it. It is not inactionable at this time. Um, so I'd, I'd hope we can keep our questions to clarity, consistency, and actionability. Um, many of Lauren's comments, as you'll see as we go on, are more about 
not necessarily the actionability, but the conservativeness of defending a lawsuit if a lawsuit were to be filed. Um, but I, I would argue that G, the comments made were of substantive issues and not whether the issue in G is actually actionable. Mandy Jo, has G changed substantially during this process? The only thing that changed in G was the addition of that blue that KP Law did. Okay, the reason I asked that is because I'm just reflecting back on our conversation about 132 Northampton Road and the arguments people made there about local, the local option. And that's, that's not our committee. That is another committee. And I just wonder whether this was discussed and I don't know the extent to which it was in CRC or TSO. So this was never in CRC and TSO approved the bylaw. This, this section has not changed from what TSA, yeah. other than that blue addition has not changed from what TSO saw. And I will them. also say that it, with the uh, gaming bylaws in Massachusetts, this kind of stuff has been out there for a long, for a while now. These kinds of specific percentages, Lynn? Uh, well, not just percentages, but even as it's stated in G. There's a lot of, oh, um, I see. Right. In, in the gaming bylaws, a lot of effort to uh, employ local. Uh, but however, they may have gone more regional or like the Amherst area. But um, I, I, we have the region after Amherst residents. Yeah, as, yeah. It, as it is. Mandy raises a very good point, um, but a difficult one, it seems to me, because um, obviously KP Law is going to raise a number of, of concerns that go beyond clear, consistent, and actionable. And I'm not sure how we can avoid discussing them at some level, because if we don't discuss them, it's not clear how they'll ever get to the council. Well, it's, it's, that's where I think we may need to flag those areas if there have been changes to them since TSO has looked at this and then send it back to TSO. Jesus Christ. I know. Uh, it, Pat, I hate I know, you. I know. I, we we have created to... the same kind of government swamp <laughs> that every other town seems to live in, and it mm -hmm. is very frustrating. I, I apologize I for my frustration. I, I would argue nearly all of these changes TSO are, are have been seen have been seen in substance by TSO. I think we just need to rely on the sponsors who have been, you know, attached to this thing from the beginning to just tell us that. And if it's been reviewed by TSO, then fine, just move on. So I think Lynn, you had a question about the the pink area, the one that we know that that we don't agree with KP law. So KP law's argument um, for changing to certify under oath that compliance with the section was not possible or practicable and away from submit documentation de detailing the efforts to meet the requirements was that um, as originally written by the sponsors, the that put the burden on the town to determine whether those efforts were um, acceptable. Um, and therefore, the con moving it to the, the certification and the rewording moves that burden to the contractor to say under oath, hey, we couldn't do it. Uh, the reason the sponsors don't necessarily agree with that wording um, or the, this change or the removal of the submitting documentation is this bylaw does not actually require the town ever to make a determination as to whether the efforts were reasonable or not. It just asks the contractor to submit documentation. There's no further action on the part of the town required once that documentation is submitted. And the sponsors believe that it's too easy for a contractor to say, oh, hey, it wasn't possible and I'll certify that under oath. And it's much harder to do that if they have to also prove that they tried by submitting some sort of documentation that includes you know, advertising of positions somewhere or things like that. Um, but the town, the, the reasons KP Law set forth for wanting the change, uh, we didn't feel were um, you know, sort of in, in accord with what we were asking because there's no, there was no demand by the, 
in this bylaw for the town to make a determination as to whether the documentation submitted was sufficient. It just needs submitted. Um, and so we would really like, we're, we're fine with keeping the certify under oath, but we would still like to keep the submit documentation and it would be, the wording would just be an and submit documentation detailing the efforts to meet, I think is how we would do it at the end of the sentence. I have no problem with it. I, I, I don't know how to say, speak to the issue of the percentages up here. I've seen them elsewhere. They could change from administration to administration. I think that's Andy's point, but you know, that your other changes, I have no problem with. Well, that's what it would look like. Yep. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry again, Mandy, apologize for my obtuseness. The reason KP Law objected to, or did they object to requesting documentation was they, what? It was too much, right, go ahead. They based it on the town, putting the town at, at, um, on the hook for determining whether that documentation was sufficient, but this bylaw does never require no, right, exactly, to determine right. sorry, that's exactly so that, point. that was yeah, their yeah. reasoning. Yeah, okay, okay. I, for one, can see your reasoning. I think that um, without requiring some kind of proof, it would be very easy for them to avoid this. Um, okay. I think, again, Manny, you see how difficult it is to, get, <laughs> to, to just be clear. I mean, this is right. Um, it's hard to avoid substance here. Wait till we get um, to this page. <laughs> I think what we're, with G and H, what we have agreed to, uh, what I'm hearing and people should pick up is that we are going to accept the changes in the document as we see them and with the addition of and submit documentation de de detailing efforts to meet these requirements. Can I suggest, it, um, this would actually <laughs> be going back on H, um, these kinds of percentages do change from time to time. Is yeah. there a way to word this that talks about percentages consistent with, I don't know, the governor or something, something that allows, I mean, those percentages could easily go up over time. And, you know, we don't want. So, so the, the thing to do is to just change them in the bylaw then if we decide they're too low. Okay. Lisa, do you have anything to say about that? I was just gonna, the only thing I'd chime in is that um, to, Andy's concern about um, being challenged on it, that these percentages have been in effect for quite a while and in different municipalities, they have requirements as opposed to shall endeavor to, and they have higher numbers and there have been no challenges um, to any of them. They've been in Boston for a number of years. They're now, Worcester just put them in for their projects. Um, Springfield has it as a requirement. Um, and there have not there have not been challenges to it. It's it's conceivable, Lisa, with the upcoming census that those numbers could change. Yes, they could go. They have only gone up where they have existed. So Boston has increased their numbers, um, and Springfield has increased the woman number. And they used to have five percent, and they increased it to six point nine. Um, uh, so that, you know, in, in Springfield, they, they modified the policy um, to increase their numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I, I always prefer to write bylaws that have the flexibility over time uh, to change with those kinds of issues. But um, if other people are comfortable that this is just something that gets reviewed regularly in this bylaw, then that's fine. But it, if we're pinning it to some um, reference that is reg regularly updated, then the bylaw should be 
pinned to that reference, but it sounds to me like we're not pinning it to a specific reference except for the present governor's goals. Yeah, I mean, I would, I guess I would just add that the, so this was set by the previous governor, Governor Deval Patrick set mm -hmm. these, this executive order. The current governor has not rescinded the executive right. order. And I know that he has increased the numbers on MB, MBEs and um, so for minority business enterprises and women business enterprises, like for example, of what DCAM and UMBA do, um, but he has not done touch the workforce goals. Um, I wouldn't anticipate that he would rescind them or lower them. Um, so it could tie it to the state's goals. Um, I, I'm kind of agnostic on it. Okay, I, I, I just don't know how we make sure that bylaws with this kind of specificity in this are regularly reviewed. That's, that's the issue that comes up for me. I think also there's a difference between a bylaw and a policy. You can change policies pretty easily. Bylaws are a little bit more cumbersome. So what you're suggesting here, I'm not saying it can't be done and maybe it's not as cumbersome as I imagine, is that every time you want to adjust a figure, you have to, you have to amend a bylaw. What would be ideal would be to have a reference to a particular policy, maybe set by um, some department in the town, like or some body, like the Human Rights Commission, um, and whatever their figures were would be the figures that the contract would have to use, and those figures would be reviewed regularly by that particular body. Um, I think Lynn is right that it's unlikely that counselors. I mean, maybe I'm wrong here, but the counselors are going to be constantly combing through the bylaws for things as detailed as this. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Maybe we just have to leave it for the moment. But I think it would be, in my mind, it would be ideal if, if H were tied to a particular policy set by a particular body in the town government, um, and the contractor would simply have to consult that body to find out what the current figures are. Setting them as they are here explicitly raises the very kinds of questions that we've been talking about. Um, could the Human Rights Commission be empowered at some point to, to take care of this? And then, I don't know. But Thoughts? I guess the question for Lisa, for me is, and she may not know the answer to this, um, is whether these towns like Springfield, Worcester, Boston actually had to change their bylaws uh, or whether they just had a policy that they could adjust because um, one would seem to be much easier than the other. Um, Springfield changed uh, an ordinance. So an ordinance? Essentially a okay, bylaw. bylaw. Um, yeah. Boston, I think it's an executive order. Okay. So it was the mayor who made that change. Okay. Okay. I, right now we don't have, from what I'm hearing, except to say these are the governor's orders, we don't have anything to pin this to. Um, so I don't know what else we can do but go on. But mm -hmm. I, that's the kind of thing I would have liked to have seen is somehow or another pinning it to something else that's reviewed regularly. By the way, our charter does require that we do bylaw review on a, a regular basis. It's just not very regular. <laughs> In our free time, we will. Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, 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 uh, GOL will take on that. I might remember. Okay. We moving on? I yeah. guess we are. Um, I I, I, so. Yeah, okay, all right. This so I left some comments in here. Um, Lauren was just commenting on lawsuits in, or the potential for some lawsuits and all. And all. Um, so the contractor already submits weekly certified payrolls um, in these instances, and they include everything but gender and whether they're a person of color. Um, so all the other stuff, identifying number, address, name, is already submitted by contractors in instances like this and all. Um, she didn't suggest deleting it. Um, we, again, went to the recapitalizing the definitional sections. And then her other one on OSHA 10 was just um, a question, I think. And we did intend to span, expand that requirement, but she didn't have any actionability issues with either of these. And they don't see a problem 
um, if your numbers get below a certain number of um, being able to identify an individual employee. So it'll already have employees names. Those are already submitted with employee names and all currently in these contracts. Mm -hmm. It's just a requirement of municipal contracting. And what we are asking in addition, again, Mandy is? Gender and person of color. Right. And the OSHA 10 card, that's, can you just? I that's, think Lisa can better handle what an OSHA 10 card is. <laughs> well, not, not so much what it is, but is that an additional requirement or is that something they do ordinarily? Lisa? It's an additional requirement here. It is um, a part of um, most construction jobs do require um, that on um, coming onto the job site when the employee gives their, shows their you know, I-9 documentation, they also uh, make a copy of the employee's OSHA 10, um, but it's not currently a requirement with municipal okay. contracts. Okay. The OSHA 10 is a certification, right? It's a certification of 10 hours of safety training for some okay. to- Right, of course. Yeah. Project. Okay, okay. Um, Andy, I'd be curious if you see either of these as putting the town at risk. Um, I, Chris could speak to the OSHA 10. Um, certainly the um, gender and people of color where these goals have been or requirements have been put in place elsewhere. It's a routine part of this, the certified payrolls now. So the UMass Building Authority with all their projects, um, they just added those columns on and the payroll departments, the HR departments of the, with the contractor fills them in as they fill in the other information. Okay, I'm prepared to move on. Any other thoughts? I can see some of the screen, not all of it. Anyone else thoughts on K? No. So number three was the next one we had a difference of opinion on with KP law. We put shall in there, KP law once may. We actually think may is more problematic than shall because it gives too much discretion. This is one that says, um, if you don't comply with these, if you don't certify you're gonna comply with these requirements and obligations, your bid will be rejected. But the way KP law wants it written is, your bid can be rejected. Um, and we think the can be rejected actually provides too much leniency and more of a risk to the town than it will be rejected because then if it's only a can, the people looking at the bid can say, well, we really like this one. So if they didn't certify, we'll, we'll be okay with them not certifying, but we'll just reject this one that didn't certify because we don't like them. There's much more discretion in a may and than a shall. So we, we intend to keep it shall. Okay, I had, um, I'm going to go to my experience as a person that's dealt with bidding for years. And that is that sometimes something like this could have inadvertently been overlooked. And yet it may be an extremely solid bid. And so to be able to say it would be a rejected out of hand causes me some concern. I understand that we want the per that we want the contractor to ultimately certify, but what this would allow somebody to do is say, "Oops, they didn't do it." Throw it in the discard pile without even considering anything else. Wouldn't couldn't they be contacted, Lynn, uh, if they didn't submit it? Are you going to submit this? I'm saying when it says shall, it basically says upon, I mean, unless it's, I mean, usually first review, anything that's shall means you're in the discard pile. Right. Um, well, they wouldn't make that mistake again. <laughs> yeah, I know, but in the process. We, I know, I know. The other, the other issue is that, you know, 
what if you only have two bids and one inadvertently didn't do this and the other one did? Somehow or another, I would like the opportunity to go back and check with the, the bidder. Um, and, and like I said, the word shall usually means on first review, you're in the discard pile. My concern with what you're saying, Lynn, is that um, that feels to me like the uh, contractor who would then get rejected because we have we chose the other one without certification has a reason to call out the town and sue us. So I feel like, I mean, maybe I was sort of making a joke with the shell, but I bet that contractor would never make the mistake again. May may really is about discretion and this you know and discretion is often subjective and that can, is what can be attacked yeah and i i understand that and i i agree with that to an extent except if it just gets down to just so few bidders and now we're basically saying okay well i mean on the other hand pat let me just say the town can also say we have too few bidders we're just going to go back out so they, if they got to the point that, you know, nobody could certify this or only one could certify it, they could just say, we declare this competition null and void and they could move on to another, they could redo it. And remind the contractor to fill it so that he, they're required, yeah. But that's, that's my, there you go. Thank you. Is this substantive or is this? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, we, we both agree think, with the change. So I'm sorry? we reject those and just leave it that way. No, I'm sorry, go ahead, Landy. Sponsors want to leave it like this, like it yeah. was original. Yeah, yep. I, I think I, I see the force of that argument. Uh, I hear Lynn's concern, um, but I also hear the thought that, look, um, this is, if this is going to mean anything, you have to do it. And if you don't do it, now I would like to think that in the process of doing all this, if something were missing, someone from staff would reach out and say, by the way, we're still waiting for X. Right. And if they still don't give you X and it's time to make a decision and you've notified them or more than, hopefully more than once, then they're out. That's it. It's not like, and I think um, Pat's point is that if it does give us discretion, it does open up room for someone to say, well, you know, you got let them get away with it, right? Okay. So I, I think I'd like to leave it as it is. It's my thought. I don't know if Andy has a thought or. Okay, so I think we're going to leave it out of the way the sponsors wanted it. It should be shall. Yep. And so five, six, and seven, the sponsors were fine with all of the changes presented in the document themselves. I didn't know what kind of um, comments the committee still wanted to see, which is why I left them in there. But all of the changes requested in the document themselves, the sponsors are fine with. My thought is if KP Law is happy with it and you're happy with it. Yeah. I'm happy with it. <laughs> is that a syllogism? No, it's not. Okay. Um, so five, six, and seven are fine. The change to three is fine. Um, we're now to D. Manny, is this again just, these are just. So, so number one, we were fine with the changes. So number okay. two is a stylistic issue. Okay. Um, I didn't highlight it. So we, number two is supposed, is one of the sections that goes, gets dropped into a TIF agreement. And so it's written, so it can just be dropped in without any changes. So it refers to this agreement and this agreement in those two and number two. Mm -hmm. um, KP law changed it to each agreement and said, you know, the bylaw would be written as each agreement. And then when you drop it in, you'd change it to this agreement. Um, so it's much more of a stylistic thing. The sponsors want to leave it this agreement so that the town doesn't have to remember to change the wording. They can really just drop it in. I like leaving it easy on the town. Ditto. Okay. So we'll, Go back to the original language. 
to this. I like that. Thank you. And then we're back to the same issues we talked about in the prior one. Right. Um, so I think, you know, the changes right. that are shown, I, I, I can fix this one too. Right. So we're going to adopt the same language and the changes that we adopted earlier. We're not going to have the same discussion all over again. Right. <laughs> so it'll read like that. Okay. Man, are you able to make that a little bigger? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, thank you. Good. Helps me at least. Getting long term eye strain. So I, I don't know what happened with the renumbering. I think there might have been an extra return in here somewhere. I don't know. Um, We'll figure it out when we accept all the changes. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. But otherwise, we again, the changes that are in the document themselves, the sponsors didn't have a problem with all the way up through L. And okay. I, I left the comments in, but they're very I'm similar sure. to the last right. ones. The sections are nearly identical. Good. Okay. And so then, to, yeah, go ahead. The debarment in number three. Um, while KP Law did not actually redline this, KP Law suggested removing it completely. Um, and we disagree with that. Um, and particularly for tax relief agreements, those agreements when, when drafted actually go to the state for approval before the tax relief is granted. Um, and so our thoughts are KP Law's concern about it not being allowed. Um, we would find out very quickly at the first time the tax relief agreement is granted whether the state will allow debarment or not, because it would go directly into that agreement. And so leaving it in the bylaw, um, we think we think it's important, number one, that if you're if you're going to do something like what happened at Beacon, we don't want to hand you any more tax relief. Um, and but we would find out KP Law's concern was it might not be allowable as part of an agreement. Um, they didn't come out and say it's not allowable. And since these go to the state to begin with, um, we would know whether the state deems them allowable or not when this is entered, when this is dropped into a contract. And so we would like to leave it in. Did, did KP Law? assume it would probably be dropped by the state? Maybe I'm not following. Pat, I think KP Law wasn't sure, right? Right. What the, basically, is it the EACC? Yeah. They look at this kind of um, information and they say, yes, you can do that. Um, because we have the right to add things to it, but they have the right of review. And they can also say, no, I don't think so. Um, so for us, it feels that it's important to have this kind of uh, fixed um, punishment. Uh, I don't know if you want to say that. Um, and because it would, every one of the agreements, I believe, have to go back to EACC. So it's not something that would be extra. Um, and, and, and and the reality is the town doesn't disbar people. That's a state action. Say that again, Lynn. I'm sorry. The town doesn't disbar people. That's a state action. Well, well, so this one, this is just saying we we can't, the sponsor that gets the tax relief is not allowed to hire anyone for five years to work on the project. Right. It's part of the contract for the tax relief that they can't hire someone that violated our bylaw or any wage and hour and tip laws in the right. past five years. Um, so it's not a full debarment. It's it's a requirement of the agreement. It's, yeah, and it's 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 timed, and it gives the um, contractor uh, the possibility of coming back in five years. But we really want to stress how incredibly important this is. I mean, given that you know, as Lynn, you brought up Beacon. Um, we don't want that contractor working on anything for five years. Well, uh, why five years? 
Pardon me? Why five years? You know, I mean, just just pick a number out of a hat. I mean, I think- No, I think the other bylaws that we looked at, um, like Lynn, et cetera, have that five year. And again, Lisa or Chris, I I defer to you, but I believe that's where we got the figure. Yeah, some some places do three years, some do five years. Um, we we think it makes sense to not a, award a cheater another contract um, in the town, um, and yet you know not bar them forever. Could be you know changes that they make to change their business practices. I would argue we have so few of these in town that exactly. less than five years is likely not to be a, a remedy or. Um, Sanction a problem at all um, because we don't do these very frequently, and so the five years makes more sense. It, it's more likely that someone who cheated the town or workers in the town in a past contract would fall and not be able to work at least on the next one. This, I think, is a substantive concern that I probably should raise if I want to raise it at all at the council, but I'm going to raise it here just to maybe you can set me straight and I can not have to raise this. But when you bar someone like this, that means the people that work for him or her also don't have a job. So it's not just a contractor that gets barred. It's all the people that work for the contractor. So I understand and, and support the general a purpose of this this bylaw and maybe five years is the right number but and maybe i'm misunderstanding something here but it seems that you know we're talking about cheaters we're talking about bad actors but and we need to to, to punish them and to get them to to be good actors um but i guess sometimes i'm just concerned that the punishment is is so severe and also first of all so when a contractor gets barred all the people that work for that contractor, they have to, they're have they going to have to go find a job somewhere else. One of the things that's true, George, about Beacon is that it wasn't a regular worker. Wage theft generally happens frequently for new hires, right. for people who are temporary, who aren't part of the contractor's uh, okay. family of workers. Right. right. Um, so I hear what you're saying, but I, I feel like the people who are freelance will probably be picked up by other um, people doing the same work. Okay. A lot of contractors have day laborers, and so it's the mm -hmm. contractor that doesn't pay that you're saying you can't work on this, not the day laborers who can find the contractor who is allowed to work on it or the sub that's allowed to work mm -hmm. on it. Okay, all right. Yeah, many times the employees are, are the construction management um, of a contractor and um, uh, the, the actual trades workers, the carpenters, electricians, et right. cetera, they come and go. They work with one contractor for one project, then they're on to a different contractor for a different project. Okay. Okay. The right. only reason I would, one of the things we always have to deal with in Western Mass versus Eastern Mass is we just don't have as many people bidding. Right. And whether they're, I mean, I think, once we start arguing three to five, three or five years, we're beyond the committee's purview. Okay. I agree. And I apologize for bringing it up. It's just, yeah. Oh, no, um, it's. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is a concern. I think that I, if I need to raise it, it should be raised at the council. So, uh, any other thoughts? So, we are going to. Um, non compliance and complaints. I think. Right. Good. So the sponsors don't agree to any changes made in this section. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so everything you see, the sponsors don't agree with. Um, okay. Let me see if I can get the whole, there's a little bit more that was deleted. I can't get the, I have to make it slightly smaller. Just because this gets a little deep and complicated, could you uh, just summarize where the sponsors are coming from and where KP law, law is coming from. I'll try. <laughs> um, actually, in some ways, I have to tell you, I'm just getting you ready for the council meeting. No, so, so KP law, I, I don't think the sponsors ever really understood the deletion of number two completely. Um, KP law 
you know, you've, you've got the comment and decertification, but this, the whole original writing contemplated, and I know Lisa and maybe Chris can answer this better, contemplated the fact that a tax relief agreement can't be decertified by a town automatically in general. Most of the time it has to be decertified by the state. There's state laws surrounding all of this. And the way it was originally written um, contemplated that, you know, it said we're required the town shall petition the appropriate um, entity and all, um, you know, and, and it seemed to, and then the second paragraph was dealing with, well, if the contractor is going to challenge that, or the sponsor is going to challenge that decertification, well, there's going to be an escrow account and all of that. And I think what KP Law thought was, well, that'll never, um, that's not been seen before. Towns don't do escrow accounts. Towns don't do stuff like that. So let's get rid of all of that. It's not going to be allowed. But um, again, this is a section that will get dropped into an agreement. Um, so number one, the state will approve that section before the agreement is granted. Um, and number two, it requires it to go back to the state to do all of that. And we're trying to keep the money available if the state does allow that decertification and the repayment of the money it's in an account and you're, the town's not going to get stiffed then, it's in that escrow account. So I, I think KP Law, sh what Lauren stressed in our meeting was many of these changes were based on less risk, not that what was there was not legal and couldn't be done, but the change that she was suggesting was less risky for the town, that mm -hmm. it might lead to less lawsuits maybe, um, or things like that. And so, so in some sense, it's a, it's a difference of not, is the language as originally proposed actionable? It's more of how much risk is, are the counselors and the town willing to accept to put forth this agreement. And, and Lisa, Chris, Pat, if I no. feel free to add anything on that. No, you did a tool for the town. I mean, as it stands now um, with the language, is it provides a, a tool for the town to use if there has been substantial wage theft and workers harmed on a project that the town had an investment in. And so this allows the town to be able to petition the state and then the state will decide, the, e, the, the state body decides yes or no. Uh, yeah. Is this on the town? Wow, I, 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 somebody else speak, <laughs> reading. Well, we don't have an actionability issue here. It seems we have an issue of risk and, and tolerance of risk. And um, so I, I don't know what to do with this in terms of discussion. Um, it's, it's obviously an issue that, that concerns me all throughout this. Um, our attorneys are perhaps by the very nature of their business um, risk averse and the sponsors um, are willing to take greater risks. And the issue for the council is how much risk are we willing to take? The attorneys are suggesting we'd be more cautious. Sponsors are suggesting that, you know, in the end the state will decide. Um, but this is not an actionability issue apparently. And it's certainly clear and it's consistent. So what are you suggesting, George, that we send it like this with the decision? As to I, I think, um, yeah, it has to, I think it goes with the original language that the sponsors have proposed um, with, and this is where it gets difficult with some sort of uh, either in a memo or in, in the discussion itself before the council, that the issue is, is, is raised and made clear to the counselors that our attorneys, I guess we, there probably needs to be at some, maybe it has to be in the GOL memo, even though many of these cases are not about clear clarity, consistency, and actionability, they're really about substance. So who writes the document or memo 
that addresses the substantive issues um, where the lawyers have said one thing and the sponsors have gone a different way. That's um, true. Yeah. Uh, I think that's important yes. that the counselors be aware of it, but it's also important that the sponsors have, you know, put forward the bylaw they want to put forward as long as it's clear, consistent, actionable. So this apparently is clear, consistent, actionable, but the attorneys wanted to remove it because of the issue of the town's uh, risk tolerance. So Andy has his hand up. Andy, please. Yeah. I'm I'm not sure how I feel about this. It's sort of getting back to it um, in some ways is uh, problems I'm having with how the committee functions as opposed to the substance and the, those two getting mixed together again. Uh, I think one of the things that we come out to and I, with all respect for uh, how much Mandy and Pat have put into this because they really have delved into issues to a far greater extent than the rest of the committee has simply because they're co-sponsors. And that discomfort that I had about how to distinguish the role of co-sponsors from the rest of the committee is in part driven by, you know, evident by this discussion. Um, and you know, my inclination is that this is of such level of complexity, not just this section, but the entire subject. I really would not like to vote on it today. And I'm then driven by Pat saying, I'm impatient because I, this is uh, something that we've been working on for quite a while and I'd like to get it to the council. Um, and you know, I think that there's a tension that is uh, floating around here because I'm looking at it and saying, this is an awfully big bylaw and with a lot of consequences and one that ought to not be rushed through this committee, uh, which gets into another subject, which is, I'm not sure that I'm totally comfortable with the prior definition given to what is uh, the role of the committee and what is clear, consistent, and actionable meant to mean. So I, I just am, um, have this whole bundle of problems that are running together here and I don't know how to resolve them. Um, George, Pat, can I just... Please go ahead. Um, I was wondering if uh, Chris Soros had any comment on this section um, and uh, <laughs> believe me, we're not rushing, um, but that's a personal opinion. But Chris, do, can you speak to this at all? Uh, yeah, um, you know, I think so section E, e and I guess it's what is was numbered one <clears throat> is simply a it's simply a procedure um, section, and it's what happens if there's a violation if the town determines the city determines that it, there's been a violation um, of the agreement it can uh, take the action that the recipient agreed to which is the rescission and and clawback if the type of tax relief is something that um, required requires approval by a state agency like the EACC in order to approve revocation, uh, then it says, then you go that way. So I, I don't really actually understand any concern that she has at all about one, because it's, you, you take the step you have the right to do if you have the right to do it on your own. If you don't, you go to the state. Um, it seems sort of um, straightforward. This, the other one about the escrow is really just, I mean, the, the only point of that is that if, you know, you get to that point where the, there's been um, the, the process of uh, revoking the agreement has, has gotten to that stage, um, it's really purely to, pr to protect the city's interest in making sure that there's um, not just 
uh, going to be the money available at the end of the day, whenever whatever you know administrative or judicial process runs its course, but that you won't have to go chasing some you know LLC or some real estate entity that that doesn't exist anymore, doesn't have any assets, and try to recover or you know file a lien on the on the land. Uh, it's really just to facilitate the city's ability to to get what it's owed under the agreement, uh, and, and that's all. I, I don't I don't see these as particularly complicated conceptually. Um, I don't really understand what risk of you know litigation uh, that the city's uh, council has in mind, and 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 I haven't seen any uh, real articulation for why. Uh, they believe that might be actually putting the city at risk. These are just really procedural steps. Um, and, you know, as, as I think um, somebody mentioned, most, if not all, of these things, uh, these agreements uh, have to be submitted to the state for approval in the first instance. And so if those terms are not acceptable, you'd know right off the bat whether the state is going to deem them to be acceptable or not. So I think I, I don't see these as a heavy lift. You know, in terms of, in terms of the legal issues, I mean, there, obviously there are policy questions and those are appropriate for, um, you know, for consideration and debate by you, but in terms of the leak, the, the question of legal risk, I don't see it. Good, Chris, thank you. Um, Lisa, your hand is up. Um, I, I was going to add similar to what Chris did. I guess I would just emphasize that this, this language would be put into an agreement with the developer. So the developer is coming to the town and saying, we want tax relief. And the town is then saying, okay, if we give you tax relief, you are agreeing to not have wage theft. And if you are found one of your contractors to engage in wage theft, here are some remedies that are gonna happen as a result of it. And so the developer is agreeing to it on the front end. And again, therefore the, the, the risk was what I had written down as well as I, I, I don't understand where that is putting the town at risk. Okay. Um, I don't know what degree this can or, or does address some of the concerns Andy raised about what this committee does or tries to do. Um, that may be something we're going to have to just continue to wrestle with. I'm not sure we can, I mean, we've been trying to resolve it for quite some time, walking this line. Um, in my mind, our job is to uh, help the sponsor, whoever the sponsor may be, um, get their proposal, whatever it is, to the council in a form that is uh, clear, consistent, and actionable. Um, even though I individually as a member of GOL might actually vote against it, because I don't agree with it. So um, that's kind of where these, you know, doing two things at once, but I think there, it's possible to do this. Um, or you might have serious substantive concerns about the document, but the document itself, um, right, is meets the criteria. So here's a case where it seems uh, E, um, we can't see a, a legal issue. I mean, there's a risk issue, but that's a different matter. Um, and it's what the sponsors want. And it seems clear it seems consistent. And as a procedure, it seems actionable. And if it isn't, the state will intervene. <laughs> we don't, can't control that anyway. So the question for the committee is, do we leave it in? Because that's what the sponsors want, given the comments by the attorney, which don't seem to be strong enough on any level of clarity, consistency, or actionability to remove it. I don't know, Andy, if that helps you, but that's sort of the way I approach it. Um, I might at the council raise a whole series of objections to this on a, uh, a policy level um, or, whatever, or risk level based on 
what I understand the attorney, well, I'm not sure I do understand the attorney's <laughs> comment here, but anyway, I could erase it at a council meeting, right? But here, it seems inappropriate. Andy has his hand up. Yeah. Yeah. I had my, I raised my hand over a slightly different thought question here, but I appreciate your, your, your comments that you just made. Um, will the inclusion of this provision affect any of the um, efforts to get um, the project going to begin with. Um, what I'm thinking is that uh, when do you cross a point, and this is uh, again getting probably beyond the question of uh, clear, consistent, and actionable or as we've defined it previously, but uh, going back to the Beacon situation, had there been a um, at what point do you put so many um, uh, requirements on um, a project where our goal was to get housing built that included affordable housing, which was a very important issue for the town. It still is a very important issue for the town. Uh, that it would either um, make it impossible for uh, Beacon to get um, EOCD support that they needed or other private funding support and make it an untenable project to them, for them to even bring forward. And uh, I guess I worry about that a little bit. Well, Andy, if I may, um, I, um, Lisa, in just a moment, but because um, now we're at different. <laughs> right, I know. It's like conversation. I actually share your concern, but, I, you know, that's a discussion, I think, for the council. Um, I, I appreciate you raising it. I it's think a thought I've had, excuse me, it's a thought I've had more than once going through this, but it's not an issue of clarity, consistency, and actionability. My right. concern is that a contractor can do what they want if there's no penalty. And we've seen that in Amherst and we've seen it all across the country. Um, and so it seems to me that knowing in advance what your contract is and what the town requires may or may not affect whether a contractor decides to um, build in Amherst. Um, but I, I think I think your concerns protect the developer, the contractor, much more than it protects anyone who is working for them. And that concerns me. Uh, Lisa. I guess just since the issues raised, I think it can sometimes get lost as we're going through so much minutia on line by line and um, about wording it this way or wording it that way of what the ordinance does. And it's actually doesn't have very many requirements on a developer or a contractor. It is saying essentially follow the law, follow all wage laws, don't hire a contractor that's recently violated wage laws and add some diversity work not not even you have to but try to have diversity on the project um, and show us documentation that you're doing this and if you do have contractors that break the law then there are repercussions for those um, so we have not found where ordinance similar ordinances have been put into place that it's had a chilling effect of all of a sudden developers are not wanting to receive tax relief um, or contracts. Um, it, in the Beacon example, I think had this been in place prior to that tax relief um, agreement um, being executed with them, 
I think, and, and then starting a construction, I think there would have just been greater care put to making sure that wage theft doesn't happen. The developer wouldn't have wanted to have the liability of having clawback, so they would have put a requirement in their, their, their general contractor's requirement that there's repercussions for you if you have wage theft. The Keith construction in this case wouldn't have wanted to have that liability, so with every sub, they would have just put in a clause if, if you cheat your workers, um, you will be responsible for you know, the payback um, that is required under this. And that would have then, we think, prevented a sub from cheating their workers. And that's really what the, this bylaw is about, is preventing wage theft from happening. Um, and any developer that plans to hire contractors that are gonna pay their workers as they're supposed to be, um, should not be in fear that this is going to prevent them from wanting to do development in Amherst. I think what we're hearing here um, is something that definitely should happen at the council again um, when this comes up for council action, this conversation with the sponsors present, including Lisa and I assume maybe Chris as long with the council sponsors because your contributions have been helpful to me. Um, but they would be helpful to me at a council meeting when I'm trying to decide how to vote on this. Um, right now, um, it seems that so I, I assume you will be there uh, for sure, and um, that will be an important part of the council discussion. Sorry. Um, usually they call right back, that's what happens. I, I usually have to take the phone off and like. <laughs> um, so what you just offered Lisa and what Chris has offered in this conversation will hopefully also happen again at the council meeting when the counselors other than myself and Andy and others who are present here will also be wrestling with this. These kinds of contributions that you're making are extremely valuable. Um, I think George- again, I'm back. I'm just, I think that as far as this committee goes, this stays in. It stays in as it's written. Um, I again have questions about the escrow. Um, and again, I'm caught because that's a substantive issue and it's something I bring up at council. Um, and so I'm torn because I wanna ask it, but it's really not appropriate. Um, so maybe I'm just gonna leave it for the moment. I can ask it offline or whatever, or at the council meeting. I think this stays as it is. I'm in other words, two stays in um, because, right? You think it's clear, it's consistent, actionable. Uh, I, I'm not sure I agree with it, but that's that's a whole other question. Let me just ask you, Lynn. you to clarify. Are you saying it stays in the way it's presently presented? No, no. Right. Rejecting it, everything that's in blue. No. In other words, the sponsors want to, uh, everything that's been rejected should be put back in because the sponsors want it. And there's no issue of consistency, clarity, or actionability. And the, the lawyer's comments um, don't address that at all. There's a matter of risk. And that's something the council is going to have to wrestle with. And I'm going to have to wrestle with. Well, and so my, my question really is not a GOL question. And it's, 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 a, it's a council question. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not going to stop anybody from asking them because I think we've had some fruitful discussion today. But it does bring up Andy's point. And we've had this issue before with GOL. And I've been on the other side of it. Um, so it, it probably serves me right. But um, if you want to raise a point, Lynn, please go ahead. But I guess to answer your initial question, um, this stays the way the sponsors wanted it, unless my colleagues on the committee feel it needs to be, um, right? I, I don't see how we can reject what they're offering um, on the grounds of consistency, actionability, or clarity. I'm sorry, Lynn? No, that's fine. I'm, okay. I'm just trying to figure out. I, I, I'm just sitting here thinking about how we work through all of this at the council level. That's Absolutely. All. And I, I, I hear you 100%. That's all. Um, it's yeah. not GOL's problem. Well, I mean, GOL produces a report that um, hopefully will be of some use in that process, but yeah. But 
this technically is not even something GOL would talk about in its report. Um, well, that's, yeah, that's, I know. Um, I think the memo could make the point that certain issues were raised, X, Y, and Z, that were beyond GOL's purview, but the council should be aware of them. I mean, I just want to make sure the counselors um, are aware of the fact that the attorney had concerns at certain points that in some cases we um, decided that we're not, we, we just did not accept or we just ignored. Um, and so they, they need to know that. So I guess, uh, and I'll just work with the sponsors on the, um, the presentation and the memo, uh, which we've now been using for bylaws. Yes, yes, I hear you. And, and hopefully I will be in that conversation too, at least what you want from GOL, I mean. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, um, and I assume you want it for Monday, but I don't know. <laughs> Depends on whether there's a vote today or not. I know. I, I think, well, anyway, we'll see. Oh, so we have made our way through this bylaw. No, there's opinion. one more. I'm sorry? Yeah. There's more. There's okay. this one last one. So KP law struck requirements for successors and interests. The reasoning um, KP law indicated was they were concerned about enforcement of it and mainly whether the definition, what the definition of successor and interest was and whether such a definition was truly enforceable um, in terms of if, you know, when it came to contracting or TIFs, um, what happens a lot is a contractor will, a person will, you know, um, incorporate or do business as one name violate a whole bunch of laws under that name and then get called for that. And so then they'll just declare, you know, just, just go away with that company and then declare business under another name and do the same thing under that name. And the, the sponsor's goal of this section, um, which it once kept in is to say, Hey, if you do that, you're, you're not going to get our contracts. You're not going to be allowed to, to do that. Um, and KP law understood that, but was concerned about the, how it could be enforced if it was in there. How would you determine that at least one of the same principles was that or this? So again, more of an enforcement thing. Um, we are unaware of a way we could pull a state definition of successor and interest into this to better clear that up. Um, I know Lisa and Chris can probably explain a little bit more, but, but we think it's an extremely important per, part of this bylaw um, to stop wage theft. And so we intend to keep it in. Here it seems the attorney has a, a more substantive objection, at least to my limited legal mind, um, since they don't even know what the term, how to define the term. So it does seem to be an issue of actionability and clarity for that matter. Um, we're using terms that aren't defined apparently in law. And, We've defined it here. Well, yes, but <laughs> we're the town of Amherst. I mean, this is okay. Um, I mean, we can define anything we want, but um, if the attorney says that, you know, they have not any awareness of this having any legal meaning. Um, so, I guess the question is. I don't think it was that they didn't know there was legal meaning. Right. Right. Yeah. It was whether as defined, the town would actually be able to identify a successor and in interest. Just practically, just practically. Yeah, just yeah. Practical practicality, not risk. Um, well, Chris or one. Lisa, anything to say about this? It's an extra tool. We, we agree that there, you, we might, you know, the town might not be able to figure out successor, you know, okay. with a bad apple. Um, but if this is there and the town is able to figure it out and wants to go after that bad actor, they can. So it's, a, it's eliminating a tool that the town could use. Um, will it be used? Not sure. It's up, to the, it's up to the town to, you know, make that decision. The town has you know, discretion 
mm -hmm. about how to enforce any of these um, provisions. I think Lisa's point is, is an important one. Um, most of this um, ordinance is designed to give the town tools to use if in situations where it determines that uh, something needs to be done, uh, they have the tools to do that. Um, most contracts I have ever seen have had requirements around successor contractors. Right. Um, if there is a definition, the feds might have one in, you know, circular 21. Um, so um, I, I, I hear the legal point at the same time, I would certainly expect any contract from the town to have a successor clause in it. That probably has pretty standard language um, yeah. that, that the attorneys would be familiar with. This is a clearly language that at least KP Law is not familiar with, and they're our attorney. Yeah, maybe they can come bad. up with something better. <laughs> okay, well, it's <laughs> not there. It's not there by law. But <laughs> it's all right. Um, okay. Do we need to go back up to the definitions at the beginning to see where the success? Where the I don't think it is. Yeah. So right. our our definition is number one: a contractor or sponsor that one has at least one officer one of the same principals or officers as the prior contractor or sponsor and is engaged in the same or equivalent trade or activity. So the definition's in here. It's that one and two. Okay. Right here. Uh, Mandy Jo, did you get that definition from any particular source? It was pulled from a, a bylaw or an ordinance from another town that's adopted it. I okay. assume Chris and Lisa would be able to probably tell you which one, but it's common in, you know, Lynn or Springfield or these other towns. Right, okay. it's in several. Okay. I, I, I have to assume state bidding law has a definition of successor. I just can't believe they don't. Well, it is something I could take back to KP Law for, for clarification. Um, um, not necessarily, I mean, we still leave this as it stands, but I could say, um, can they help us with language here or not? I'm just, that's a suggestion, not a. Right now, I have only one item to take to them, which is fine. I'm not sure you want me to take this to them. Um, but I guess the question would be, um, is there language that you could point us to? I don't know. I mean, in our meeting, she didn't have language to point to. She just deleted it. Right, right. right. Well, now we're going to ask her very specific. We're going to make a very specific request. Find us language. <laughs> it's, not, it's not, you know, please, please do what, you know, you're our lawyer. Find us language that, uh, or you may feel this is uh, adequate. I mean, as Pat has pointed out, this already exists in other towns and cities, um, in other bylaws or ordinances. Um, so. I, I, you know, we tend to overthink things, I know. Um, seems to be a I disease of GOL. Successor con I, want it, I want a successor section in here, so. And you'd like it worded appropriately? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I can, yeah, okay. I can take that to KP Law. But again, it, it fits in that category of, you know, of whether or not it's a GOL. Issue. Well, I think it's an issue of clarity. Um, yeah. And, and I think actionability to some degree, but certainly I, I think it's certainly perfectly within GOL's purview. Um, it's, we don't understand this term. The lawyer doesn't understand it. I mean, we just need clarity with this this term, yeah. and we ask our lawyers for help. You say they're unaware of state definition. All right, well, this does seem like the end, unless somebody has yet another page that I'm not aware of. Uh, this is the end of the responsible employer. 
I mean, it feels like, <laughs> wait a minute, there's another page here, we missed it. Um, and we have gone through it line by painful line. And we have, I believe with Mandy's help, produced a final version of it. But there are two items that you would like me to get further uh, input from KP Law on. Do we need to vote on this? I would think normally we would. Can we vote on it uh, without resolution on the two issues that we're going back to KP Law about? Um, so, as sponsor, or even as a GOL member, um, this was as a sponsor this was proposed as a double package and pat's probably going to yell at me and hate me for nah, nah. <laughs> it's a double package if if gol is not going to consider the other part today um the wage and tip theft portion today um it might be better to not vote today and wait to see if kp law because it's not I, as a sponsor i don't necessarily want one to come up without the other at yeah the, i agree I agree. Uh, if we're not going, you know, we're coming on two hours. If if GOL as a committee is going to decide to stop here and not continue on with the review of wage and tip theft, it's not as important to vote today. Yes, I agree. I certainly would like to keep this meeting and, and for two hours. I also can, Sorry, Lynn. can I also keep on your comment, Mandy Joe what? and Pat, that this would not we will not take one to the council without the other. Right, we want them both to come up. Thank you. I, I, I'm just trying to get my order straight. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being willing to take some. <laughs> um, this raises a just the timing question for GOL. Um, we do have a scheduled meeting for next week. I was hoping to cancel that, but um, perhaps we should meet at our scheduled time next week. I'd be happy to do that. I can't say I'd be happy, but uh, but I then know, I can never I say would. that. <laughs> <laughs> Happiness is uh, Eng English, uh, strange English. I think I'm not really interested. Um, I can do that. Do you want to tackle this? Uh, so we would tackle the other half of this uh, a week from today, and hopefully by that point, um, I would have answers to the two things that you've asked me to look into. And this one can be presented with a clean copy then too. Okay, okay. And the only thing I'm gonna ask, um, Amanda Jo, and that is to start thinking about how to raise the issue of risk um, as you make a clean copy. And that's to use a sponsor, you and Pat and Kathy as sponsor. Yeah. Right. How this yeah. gets presented to the council. Yeah. We have to bring that to the full council, even though GOL is not. Yeah. And I don't know whether that would be a TSO rediscussion or not. I, I don't think they've ever had that experience, but then they don't have a lot of depth of experience anyway. I don't think she realized, George, that you're on TSO. No, I think she meant that as TSO. She she was not speaking of our depth, which is extensive in other areas. She just meant TSO. <laughs> That's how I'm going to interpret that. Thank you. I, I, okay. All right. Go ahead. That's it. All right. Um, I would like to. I'm sorry. Let's not vote this. Let's not vote today. I don't think we're able. To, we cannot vote today. Um, but we are agreed, it seems, by consensus to meet a week from today. I will make sure that gets posted. I will bring answers to those two questions. Mandy will provide us with a clean copy of, of the wage tip um, uh, responsible by, uh, 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 responsible, uh, whatever. We'll get that presented. We will go through um, the wage theft bylaw and hopefully be able to vote on both. On the Can I ask a question about the wage theft one? Yep. Um, if the sponsors are accepting the changes that KP law made to or suggested to that bylaw, can we just accept them and present them as non-track changes? 
Right. Um, so it's a cleaner copy for next time? Or do you yes, want think, us to yeah, keep think, all of those changes or just present only the ones that are still disagreed upon? Can I, can I just ask you, because um, I have mine, mine's all marked up. Can you just explain to me color wise in the printed copy? Uh, is the, are the red, the sponsors changes? So I don't know what yours came up with. Um, the ones marked author, I, we had some issues with some some background accepting of stuff. The ones marked author, which on the screen here are purple um, in wage and tip theft, but who knows what color they are in yours, are what KP law suggested. The Can ones- Jump in, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I, I need to jump off for a 1230 call. Um, yeah. So thank you. I Chris will not join us next week, but it, um, I'd be happy to even just listen in um, to the meeting or be there if you have any questions on the wage and tip. That would be great, Lisa. Yes, thank I you. Would include, I would include you as a, as a panelist, yes. And, and I'll, I'll sign off today as well. Thank you for your thank consideration. You. Thanks for including us. Thanks, Lisa. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your help. So I guess, so, so to go back to Lynn, if it's marked author and whatever color your author color is, that's KP law changes. Whatever color is my color in the comments, Mandy Jo Haneke, that is sponsor changes. Okay, thank you. So, so to give you an idea, whatever color your changes in the top penalty block are, those are KP law changes throughout. Thank whatever you. color the aggrieved party deletion is, that is sponsor changes. So just up front, you want to keep the $1,000 no, we don't want to keep the 1000 no, no. We want to keep it just just to Section F retaliation. Applicable. So, so that, that would be my next question. So do you want us to present next week with all of these changes still showing as changes, or do you want us to only highlight those that are still in disagreement? So, for example, I could present a bylaw that shows the up to $300 per violation with the $1,000 fine per aggrieved party deleted completely. Well, fixed completely showing in black. Because, because we agree with- Okay you. and agree with that change. It oh. wouldn't even show aggrieved party here if that's what this committee wants. And, but it would still have the highlighted any violation and the removal of Section F retaliation highlighted and still showing a change because the sponsors in KP law don't agree on that change. I think we should go with whatever was in the packet today. Really? Okay. I was going to actually suggest that if we have agreement between the sponsors and KP law, there's no reason for us to, um, because we're just going to, I mean, what would, on what grounds would we possibly disagree? Okay. Right. Um, that's my thinking. Now, someone might say, well, you know, I've read it and I've got an issue, even though the lawyers don't have an issue and the sponsors don't have an issue. So we can present both. I, I can clean it up for those that want to see a clean one. And this one can still be in the packet for those that wanted to see what did get changed. That's fine. Either way, it, it, accepting what you've agreed on is fine too. Okay, I, what I prefer is seeing a document that only shows places where you and the lawyers disagree still. Yes. Okay. That's, that's my preference, but that's one vote. Two votes. <laughs> you don't count. You, you and Mandy don't count. She does count. I agree. Um, All right, thank you. I agree with George, that's fine. Okay. okay. I, I can clean that one up then too. All right. Someone remind me again, because my brain is fried now. What is the other thing I agreed to ask Kate Papey Law about? Well, um, they're, they're marked as comments in the document I'll send you later right. today. Okay, That's, it's, I have it written down somewhere, I can't find it. Can we agree that the minutes, if people had a chance to look at the September 2nd minutes, if you have, I have looked at them, I'm happy with them. Um, I'd like to just adopt them by consensus, but if you're not ready, we can put it off till next week. I move we adopt. Okay. A second. All right. So do we need a vote? 
No. I, I think I, it's I think unanimous. By consensus, I think we're going to accept it by consensus. I will pass them on to Athena as approved. Um, anything else? Any items? I, I, I'm still putting off the, uh, you, you may have seen that we did get, I did have one, thanks to Andy, I did send one question to KP Law about the wild animal bylaw. I haven't actually looked at their answer yet. Um, apparently, it, it's, uh, Paul was impressed by it. Um, but do you want me to put that on the agenda for the seventh or not? Yes. The but other we have, uh, have very few differences, so I don't think it'll take as long. Okay, I, I think you're right. So I will put that on the agenda after wait theft. Yeah. Discussion of the process for town manager evaluation, et cetera. I'd like that to be an agenda item for this committee. We have a resolution, George. Oh, we have a resolution. So maybe the resolution, wage theft, and um, the wild animal is enough for one meeting. What's the resolution? It's about the east-west rail. East-west rail. Okay. Thank you. So it'd be those three items. I, I, I could put it on there. And obviously, we don't get to it. We don't get to it. So maybe I'll put it on there at the end. Um, anything else people have uh, upcoming or want to be added at some point? You had public, you need to do public comment, but there's no public. Okay, thank you. All right, then I am prepared to declare this meeting of GOL adjourned. And my thanks to all of you for uh, your work today. It's uh, not easy, but uh, important. So thank you all. And yeah. thank you, Emily. Yes. Thanks, Emily. All right. I'm heading out. Problem. Go well.